Okay, it is 12.30, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I know it takes a lot to just even carve out just 20 minutes of your time. Um, so I'm going to shoot for less than 30 minutes, and then at the end of the call, I will be available to answer any questions um, from the PowerPoint, um, any general peak questions, um, anything that pertains to peak, I'll be available um, for 30 minutes after the call. Um, so today we will be talking about um, your activity committee and supporting the human spirit. Um, as we go through today's presentation, um, please keep in mind that not every format um, works for every home and every group of residents. So just keep that in mind, have an open, open idea and how you can relate things to your home. The intent of this is to get some ideas flowing and really for me to ask you and your team members some thought provoking questions um, about your current practices. So today we will review some peak criteria. We're gonna learn about the importance of an activity committee. We're gonna review the dimensions of wellness. We will reflect on your home's current practices. We will discuss different methods of resident feedback, and then we will review items for a committee agenda. This presentation, um, like I said, is gonna cover best practices also, um, as well as what is required to meet the outcomes. At the end, we'll kind of circle back and differ differentiate best practices um, versus what's required to meet the peak, out peak outcomes. The core goal that we're gonna focus on today is team members work together to discover and support what gives each meaning resident and pleasure. Um, just a quick review of the core. Um, there's two supporting practices, free time and planned and spontaneous activities. Um, free time includes information is gathered about resident routines, preferences, and daily pleasures. Information is available to direct caregiving staff. Residents live individualized daily routines supported by person-centered care plans. Individual, spiritual, and cultural preferences are supported. Residents are honored when they pass on. Those are all free time uh, supporting practices. Under the planned and spontaneous activities, we have residents are involved in planning formal activity schedules and residents are involved daily in determining spontaneous activity. Um, so we're going to focus specifically on this outcome. Residents are involved in planning formal activity schedules. And so under that, um, from the guidebook, it says events and activities in your home should reflect the interests of the people currently living in your home. One way to do this is to involve residents in planning the activity calendars. Whatever strategy you use, residents should be able to talk about how they participate in this progress. Activity professionals should also get the information, should use the information they gather from residents through assessments in activity calendar planning. So like I said, when we started, um, I understand that not every home is gonna be able to do things the exact same way and that you will have to customize to fit your resident wants and needs based on staff availability and skill sets. Um, I want the main takeaway from what we discussed today is to be that input is continuously being collected. And that's even if a resident does not attend a um, group activity or whatever type of group that meets. And I think I had someone in the chat. Jenny, are you watching the chat? The slides are changing. Are they not changing for you guys? Oh no, okay. Sorry, let me try again. Okay, 
let me know if they're not changing with me. Um, so the main takeaway is that input is continuously collected, and that is even if residents do not attend group activities or whatever type of group that meets, that we're still gathering um, information from them. And so um, taking a step back, um, since evaluation season is um, wrapped up, uh, our team has been working with KDADS to update some outcomes in our program. And this is specifically one that we're looking at updating and it will tentatively be changing to residents are involved in planning formal activity schedules on an ongoing basis. And so um, right now um, it's all tentative and we're gonna talk um, more about these changes um, that are kind of coming down the pike at the end of the presentation. So really the question we wanna be asking ourselves is why is having a activity committee or just committees and getting feedback um, generally from residents good? We wanna make sure that residents are living their lives how they want to live it. Almost always residents are able to continue activities they were doing prior to moving in, but they might have to be adapted some but they are still able to participate. They just need some support. Residents might learn about a new activity or gain a new skill after moving in. We wanna make sure we're empowering residents to continue to make their own choices. Oftentimes, activities um, gives both staff and residents a chance to have a conversation and learn more about each other by learning more about the resident and spending time with them, we're able to have a better bond with them and provide better care because we know them on a deeper level. Um, this is a great thing to do and it's very attainable. We just have to change the way we're doing things and we're not changing what we're doing. We're just changing how we do it. By getting their feedback and using it, we're giving the residents choice and the power of independence. So now we're gonna kind of go to best practices route off of PEAK. Um, so these are the dimensions of wellness. This is not a PEAK requirement, but a best practice. Uh, many of the dimensions that uh, we will talk about have a lot of overlap and you can fit a lot of different activities into different categories. So keep this in consideration um, when you're creating your calendar to have a variety of types of activities Something that could be beneficial for your home is to have a set amount of goals for each dimension and plug in activities that are of interest to the residents in your home. So for example, um, your home could have at least two activities intended to address each dimension each week. And I'm sure that most of your homes are already having a variety of activities, but sometimes being intentional in about what we're doing will most likely increase um, both staff and residents satisfaction and happiness. And so as we go through um, these dimensions, think about- yes, How can I help you? Think about how they could fit um, to fit your home and your residents um, in a group setting one-on-one -on -one or um, as a resident independently on their own. So I got this picture from the Global Wellness Institute. And oftentimes when we think of wellness, we okay. typically think about exercise and eating right, but it's so much more than that. Yeah. Um, someone is not on mute. Um, so looking at the physical um, aspect, we wanna think about nourishing a healthy body through exercise, nutrition, and sleep. And so some examples of activities that could fall under that would be exercise groups or learning about food and um, health with the dietitian. Under mental, we want to be engaging the world through learning, problem solving, creativity. So this is any type of learning activity. It could be going to a museum, having your own lunch and learn on um, topics of interest. Under emotional, we want to be aware of and accepting and expressing our feelings and understanding the feelings of others. 
This can be done through support groups, meditation, music therapy, art therapy. We're really just giving residents a way to express their feelings. Under spiritual, we are looking at searching for meaning, a higher purpose in human existence. Um, this could be Vespers or devotion, but sometimes we really need to work hard to think beyond religion. Um, this could also be um, meditation, um, celebrating holidays that might not be um, mainstream holidays like Christmas. Um, another um, example that I have um, that we've gotten from a home, a resident who uses crystals and helping them kind of get set up with their um, their practice whenever the moon cycle was in the appropriate time. I don't follow um, crystals, but they had more information from the resident and they supported them in doing that. And so that would be an independent activity. Under social, um, we wanna think about connecting and engaging with others and our communities in meaningful ways. So this could be done through happy hours, day trips out in the communities and other fun um, special events. Under environmental, we want to think about how we foster positive interrelationships between planetary health and human actions, choices and well-being. So activities that could relate to this are um, going out on walking trails or out, out in nature. Um, working in a garden, recycling or doing some upcycling projects. It could also even be taking residents to a fishing pond or having a picnic in the park. And so try and keep these um, dimensions of wellness in mind and how you can expand on your current practices with these. And so now we're gonna kind of reflect on our current practices. Um, first, we wanna look at initial information that's being collected and then how to maintain those individual preferences. And so I'm really just kinda kind of rapid fire some questions um, to just think about your practices. So in general, how is your home deciding what activities will happen? Are they being decided on by residents? Um, activities is an all hands on deck um, in, in homes. And so even if you aren't in the quote activities department, um, you can still participate in some fashion. Some homes um, distribute um, facilitating or hosting activities with different departments. Each department will host an activity on the frequency that fits that home and resident need. Um, so for example, HR will play the Wii with the residents for 30 minutes, one day a week, every other week. Um, dietary could host a cooking class once a month that lasts an hour, and that's um, the special dessert of that day. It's important to consider um, how to take existing workload and comparing this, how it can fit into resident needs and wants. Another example is maintenance or whomever the groundskeeper is um, can work outside with residents to water plants or help um, care for the plants together. You just to turn the volume up on the TV. So a great tool that we have on our website is um, the core area audit. So when I'm all done, Today, I will send out my slides. And this is the hyperlink that takes you to our website where you can kind of grade yourself um, on current practices. And so what we use during eval season, um, we're looking at the same things that's on, on this and to compare if it is meeting the peak criteria. So when residents are moving in, um, we want to get as much information as possible I can hear it. and then build on this the more we get to know them. So think about how your information collection tools when a resident is moving in. Are the questions being asked, are they open-ended? 
Is there plenty of space even for staff to make notes? What is the process for team members when they learn new information? Where do they document it? And do they know who to talk to if there is something um, that does come up? Under um, religion and spirituality, it's important to learn how the home can support the resident. Is there anything about their religion that we should know to better care for them? Do they follow a certain diet due to their religion? Does their death look differently with this faith or spirituality? A lot of homes are kind of missing the mark on the spirituality portion. Um, it's important to keep in mind that we, we do want to think beyond just coordinating attending a church service once a week. But keep in mind that that is a good practice. That's a good thing to do. Um, but how can we support them individually? Um, so I had kind of talked about the person with crystals. Um, so that is very applicable to here. Um, so she um, she practices outside of Christianity and she likes to burn incense and put crystals out to charge during full moons. The home supports her in this by reminding her when the full moons are coming and staff are helping her get them out. Um, and then they also found a place where it would be safe for her and as well for others to burn incense. And so um, really getting to know residents and doing everything you can in your power to help support them is huge. Some other good points of info to make sure you're collecting are um, what are their what are their interests and their hobbies prior to moving in? What was their life like before moving in? We want to make sure that the transition is as similar as possible prior to them moving in, so that way there there isn't much disruption in their life. What are some of their favorite idle time activities? Um, so we kind of want to think beyond you know watching TV. What do they like to do in their free time? Do they have any challenges to participate in activities? And so we want to be thinking about, um, you know, do they have limited left side mobility or poor vision? Um, can they not walk long distances? And so once we identify those things, what can we do to adapt our activities so that they can still participate? And so um, Jenny and I um, have been working on creating a sample tool um, that uh, captures a variety of information, um, and we're working on finalizing that. And so we're hoping to share it next month during the Lunch and Learn presentation on welcoming a new resident. And it covers much more than just activities. Um, but the main goal here is that the care plan reflects their preferences. And so once we collect all this good information, we want to make sure that the care plan is clear and concise on the resident's preferences, goals, and um, any interest, anything that's important to them. It needs to be clear. We want to make sure that we're getting staff buy-in and feedback. And so it's important to find out what pieces of information are they missing? What information do they need to provide better care? Um, so there's many ways to collect feedback um, from residents, but today we're going to focus mainly on a committee meeting. Um, we're also going to talk about a questionnaire. Um, it's important to be intentional with our efforts to gather input from residents. Oftentimes, direct caregivers are really getting a lot of input from residents. And so I've asked before, but do they know what to do with this information? Are they able to spontaneously make it happen or is it something they need to pass along? So it's important to consider um, having an anonymous way for residents to provide feedback. Um, not all residents might feel comfortable sharing with others verbally, uh, especially if they've had any past trauma. And so some questions to ask yourself, are we already doing a regular questionnaire for residents? 
what kinds of questions are being asked? Is everyone able or asked to participate in this or is it just a pool? What is the format? Is there a team member that's able to assist a resident complete this if, if it's needed? Um, and so once we're getting this information back, how is it being organized and used? And so something else I do want to note under um, having an anonymous way, I have seen several um, comment boxes where grievances can be put in the question, comments, concerns box. It's sometimes kept at a high level. And so take into consideration that if someone is in a wheelchair, are they able to also access um, the comments and grievance box? For a committee, um, some questions on that. Do you already have a committee or a group that meets? How often are they meeting? Who is invited? Is this a closed or open group? Is everyone able to participate? Is this a formal group with an elected resident chair or is it more of a informal group discussion? Is the setting welcoming and encouraging for residents to come? And so something to keep in consideration with having it be welcoming, we want to make sure that staff are talking about it in a positive way that's encouraging to go. Having a positive outlook on the meeting, that, that really can make an effect on the attendance numbers and the participation. And so what kinds of conversations are had? Are we just kind of talking about you know, what they want to do? Is it just planning events? Um, sometimes it's very general. Sometimes we have very specific items. And so how is this being organized? Are residents leading this with staff assistance or are staff leading it with resident assistance? Are staff telling the residents what they have planned and asking for the residents if, if they approve it? or if the residents are really feeding information and then staff are plugging it in to the calendar. Are residents providing any changes that they want for the next month's calendar? We really wanna look at how much of this process is resident driven. Are resident family members and resident friends able to come and participate and provide suggestions? Are notes and records being kept? This is so important to keep to keep documents on. So we want to make sure that we're keeping time and date, who's attending, and at least general topics. I found using these these few points very beneficial with residents that I've worked with in the past. And I always come up with at least several um, topics to discuss. That way we have some, some guideline to follow. The residents I've worked with have always wanted um, to for me to facilitate and moderate, but we have always done it group discussion style, very informal. Um, we start with going through the list of any follow-up topics and then we discuss any new topics and residents can chime in if there's anything that needs to be added to the agenda at any time because it is a very informal group group style. Um, if there's any upcoming events, which there almost always is, we include that as a topic. And when we're talking about any upcoming events, um, I found it easier to break it into different sections to talk about food activities and any decorations they want. Um, and then sometimes um, it's just good to have, to identify things for each group, each home, um, to identify reoccurring items to just leave on the agenda for every month to just remind or um, discuss again. Um, 
And so um, by doing this in a group style, um, it's very beneficial to get very basic information and to get an idea of what residents are wanting um, at one meeting. And so looking at if there's any upcoming events, we talk about it one meeting. Um, so let's say um, 4th of July. So at the May um, activity meeting, I will kind of get very general ideas from residents. And then if they don't have anything specific that they're thinking the next month, I might present them um, a couple of ideas and they can decide um, what they want, how they vision their little party, um, their celebration, whatever event is going on. And so we want to make sure that it's not um, how we as staff envision it. We want to make sure that their events and their activities reflect them and their ideas. Um, like I said, sometimes you have to vote on the ideas. Sometimes you can just do it um, group discussion style. Um, but we want to make sure that we take into consideration um, that if your home does decide to implement the dimensions of wellness, uh, the activity committee is a great place um, to start identifying different activities with residents and decide, you know, how frequent you want your goal to be with each of those dimensions of activities. So kind of to wrap things up here, um, reviewing best practices versus the criteria. Um, best practice is asking open-ended questions. This gets us the best information, but the requirement is just that information is collected prior to move-in and updated as needed. Um, it just needs to be relevant information. Best practice, too, is having a meeting agenda. You don't have to have an agenda, but you do have to have records kept from the meetings that you can provide as um, evaluation documents. Number three is having multiple ways to collect feedback. You don't have to have multiple, but we know that that's the best way to get as much information as possible. But the requirement is that you're getting information ongoing. The last one is dimensions of wellness. Um, activities should just be thoughtful in the way that they are reflecting current residents' interests and hobbies. Um, by using the dimensions of wellness, you're just having a more thoughtful and in intentional way of providing a variety of activities. And so the main thing is that residents have individualized care plans that are supported. Um, so we just wanna make sure that we're collecting information from residents, it goes in the care plans and that we're making it happen. So that is all of the um, presentation I have for today. Um, if your home or your team members have any updates and emails or contact information, please contact our office as we do not know um, about those changes in your homes. The next Lunch and Learn will be June 20th at 1230. It'll be about 30 minutes and then we'll have that same 30 minutes on the call afterwards for any questions. And it'll be talking about welcoming a new resident. Like I said at the beginning, um, we are making some updates to outcomes and then the guidebook will reflect that. So once we have those changes finalized and approved by KDADS, we will be reaching out to do a similar style lunch and learn um, to review those with you. And that'll be a recorded um, session also. Um, so that's all I have now. So if anyone has any questions, I will be available here. But thank you all for attending. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Okay, so there was a question in the chat. It said, how um, to handle spontaneous activities in the building? If you have some insight on what that might look like. For example, is it acceptable to help the resident to contact family 
or friends that may be able to do something like take them outside of the grounds for an activity or fishing. Um, so obviously this is a very um, case by case situation. Um, all residents are different. Family dynamics are different. Um, so if there's a group of residents that want to go, it might be better to just try to organize how you can um, how you can make this happen. Obviously, some things can't happen immediately. Um, my the best way I tell homes to meet this is to have a practice of when residents come into the dining room or we're helping them get ready for the day. If staff just ask them, what do you want to do today? That is a great way to meet this, but that's the first part is, is finding out what residents want to do spontaneously. But then the second part is making it happen. So um, if they wanted to go out um, with their family, I do think it would be spontaneous to support them in that. But I think what we're really looking at is how staff can facilitate and host. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't facilitate them getting in contact with their family or helping organize um, something with them. Um, does that answer your question? Sarah? Okay, we'll move on to the next question. If, if there's any follow-up question on that, let me know and we can go back through it. Um, the next question is from Redbud. Can the activities committee be a part of another meeting, for example, resident council? Yes, activities can. Um, keep in mind that for food, the food core, we do want to think beyond resident council. And so um, including this in resident council will we'll meet um, as long as we're getting the ongoing um, feedback collected. The next question is, how can you get other employees to help participate in activities when everyone holds multiple roles, um, like activities is also SSD marketing, in-town transports, maintenance is laundry and housekeeping. How do you have suggestions on how to get people to help um, easy the caseload? Um, so like I said, Really, we want to work smarter, not harder. Um, we want to translate the things that we're already doing and how how can we involve residents um, in our job duties and our activities if they are things of interest to the residents. Um, so for example, um, let's do um, marketing. If there's some office work that residents could participate in or to have them um, welcome uh, people on tours, to have kind of a welcome group um, that could support um, staff when they're in that situation. That's an idea um, for maintenance, laundry and housekeeping. Um, if there's just towels for residents, if they want to fold, um, that would overlap into community involvement. Um, housekeeping, same thing. Um, we just kind of need to be mindful about what we're doing and um, if there's anything that would be applicable um, to residents or same thing, going outside and helping water flowers. Um, but kind of what I was getting at in the actual presentation, um, basically we're taking a time out from um, staff jobs, um, from traditional job duties. So if you're the HR director, you're not gonna be doing your HR stuff. We're gonna carve out, you know, 15, 30 minutes of our time um, one day a week um, or every other week um, to do something of interest that residents want to do that's driven by residents. Does that answer your question, Kaylee?
Okay. If it doesn't just comment below. Um, okay. Yes. The trick is to getting them to do that. So, um, in my past, um, I have tried to gather information on, um, staff on an individual level also about what their hobbies and their personal interests are. Um, so for example, um, when I was an assisted living manager, one of our um, team members, she liked to do yarn working. She liked to crochet, knit, and that was just her deal. She loved it. And so um, to help keep things flowing, um, the activity director can al always be there 24 seven. Um, so to help kind of plan um, activities seven days a week at all, you know, relatively all hours, one of the activities was yard work, yarn working with that staff. And so we need to get that buy-in from staff and find out what they want to do, what their interests are that match up with residents. So if, if someone told me, oh, I do about just any activity. Um, but if someone said I had to do yard, yard work outside when it's cold and there was a resident that wanted to go outside and be in the cold, I might not be the best person for it, but there might be another staff that is. So we want to get staff input, get buy-in, and see what their thoughts are. Um, I think that might be your biggest, your biggest part on that. Okay, back to Sarah. Um, what we've struggled with is um, that requires an outing that will likely have to be planned, which then makes it not considered spontaneous. And we have then struggled with passing that. We do try to meet things that can be handled on site. Okay, so um, yeah, like I said earlier, not we can't always make things happen off, off site. Um, so examples of spontaneous activities that could happen on site, um, Say you have residents that love to watch football and um, at dinner time, you know, the game's coming on um, and you propose to the whole, the whole bunch. If anyone wants to um, watch the game, we're going to put it on in the family room because one resident asked you um, or you know that that residents are interested in those teams. Um let me think of some other examples of spontaneous activity. Um, another example could, it can even be just going out, um, out for a little walk. Um, oftentimes when people think about spontaneous activity, they do think that it does have to be this grand, this grand total planned um, on a whim activity, but it doesn't. Um, and sometimes that that is a big hurdle that homes have um, is thinking about these spontaneous activities that do happen. Um, because oftentimes, you know, a lot of homes do do acknowledge and do respond to resident um, resident requests um, quickly. And so sometimes they're just hard to think of what what we've done in the past. Um, so sometimes even just kind of being mindful about things that we've done spontaneously um, and just kind of keeping a log. So that way, whenever we do have evals in the spring, um, you have these this list in your back pocket of things that we have done. Um, for example, um, there was one home that had a Taylor Swift party um, when Taylor, um, had announced her concert. Um, one of the homes that I was working in when there was a royal wedding, um, two residents decided to stay up or get up and um, and watch it. And so they had a little watch party to watch the the vows in the family room. And so things like that. It doesn't have to be a grand gesture. Um, if anyone else has any ideas of um, simple, um, simple, spontaneous activities that they've done would be great. Um, but Sarah, I think the biggest thing that you could do to really work on meeting this is, 
is working with staff to daily ask them or periodically throughout the day, what do you wanna do today? And even if it is, I wanna play Jenga and Jenga is not on your scheduled activities, that's spontaneous. It's an unplanned activity. So I'm, I hope that was good clarification. Sometimes I ramble. Any other questions? And it doesn't have to be about the presentation. It can be about peak in general too. Yes, I will send these out. 